Okay, the recording has started. This is the July 9th, 2019 Crossplane Community Meeting. So we will go ahead and first start off uh, with some of the uh, recent progress on the 0 0.3 milestone. So let's take a look at that. So the items in the 0 0.3 milestone, we had um, done an effort to scope out some of the biggest quality issues uh, related to experience and reliability, um, stability, performance, things like that. And then we also have a number of big design issues that we want to tackle as well. So uh, this list is um, semi-sorted, I would say with uh, some of these big design issues here uh, moved up towards the top. Um, so there are, uh, is, is Nick on the call? I don't think Nick was in the participants list. Okay. Um, so yeah, so some of these, uh, these designs here, they're some of the meatier parts of, uh, you know, what we want to accomplish with the Crossplane, uh, with Crossplane as a platform over the next, um, you know, end of the year and into next year, over the next couple of releases. And they're the riskier items. So we want to front load those and, you know, flesh out uh, some of the details around those stories early on uh, before we get too far. So um, I think we've talked about a fair amount of these before. Um, so I don't think we need to go into detail about them now, but the point is that we're front loading these riskier designs now, and then also taking a focus on uh, some of the major um, quality and experience related issues. Uh, there are a few issues that uh, do not yet have assignees. I'd say more than um, more than half of the issues that are still open in the milestone do have assignees with them. So there are some opportunities to take up some of these uh, unassigned issues um, as we try to complete this milestone over the next uh, next um, number of weeks. I believe that the 0 0.3 project board is open. I'm sorry, is uh, updated. And uh, there are a couple of things that are currently in review that we will talk about later on in the agenda. And we have a lot of things currently in progress right now. I think one of the items that uh, when I was reevaluating uh, or revisiting the items that we currently have in the 0 0.3 milestone, one of the ones that um, you know, I think is, does have some risk associated with it and uh, we may not have clear ownership of that right now is around the release pipeline. We, we have a lot of the release scripts and build infrastructure set up, but we do not, um, there are a few pieces of it missing. And when we released 0 0.2, we had to do some of those steps manually to run the, um, the build, pa packaging, publishing, and promotion phases um, from a developer laptop. So we would like to you know, integrate that in further with our continuous uh, uh, integration environment so that we have the official build server running the um, official release build and publishing it and doing all those uh, work, having it fully automated. But, um, it's, uh, I don't think anyone has started work on that right now. So that is a risk to call out for, um, for the, when we get to the actual release of 0 0.3. Have, have you used a uh, go releaser? I have not heard of that. I don't know what that is. It's just a CI CD helper tool. Uh, I've used it on a few projects that it, it, um, handles a number of responsibilities of which is pushing your um, your release binary artifacts to your GitHub. Uh, so builds them, pushes them to your GitHub, pushes Docker images, updates, change logs, uh, that does a few different things. Um, we, 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 so we actually have a whole lot of that implemented in the uh, build submodule um, that you know we have uh, in, in, in incorporated into the crossplane repo. 
um, you know, things like uh, packaging the container into a container image and pushing it to uh, the image repository and uh, pushing artifacts to GitHub and all that sort of thing. So they're actually pretty much completely automated there. What's missing here is the pipeline integration to actually call uh, those those um, those make file entries uh, with the right um, you know credentials etc from on the release server. So most of the actual work is done here. It's just kind of integrating in with the CI to call it is what's missing here. So hopefully this, this is a fairly scoped effort. We just uh, will need an owner to. Uh, take it on and then to, you know, test it and, and get it to a reliable point as well. Yeah, I've, I've worked with Jenkins and Circle and Travis, et cetera. Um, you know, it sounds up my alley. So oh, that's a milestone. I'll pick it up. Cool, Marcus. That's really cool. It sounds like you were um, listing some of your friends there. Like, oh, I've worked with Jenkins and Travis and whoever else. You're a popular guy, Marcus. Yeah, it, it, we all worked at the... Uh, the butler shop, so butlers together. <laughs> All right. Um, so that is the just a quick rundown of the 0 0.3 milestone and um, project board. Does anybody have anything that they want to call out uh, on the scope of 0 0.3 or some issues that uh, are included or may not be included yet? All right, so I'm gonna to move to the next uh, agenda item then. So um, we've been talking about um, a concept that we're currently calling Stacks uh, for a little bit now. And I wanted to more formally introduce this in the community meeting here, just kind of as what, something that we're exploring and trying to understand better to offer a better user experience around the cross-plane platform. Um, but there will be much more work here to dive into it and to flesh it out and to you know, present more high-level designs um, around this in the coming weeks. But essentially, um, you know, this, uh, this idea of what we're calling stacks for crossplane, uh, just real quick to kind of summarize it for everybody, is that you know, we, it, it takes uh, the idea of what, we're call, what we've called extensions so far, it takes that a little bit further. So for extensions, um, you know, that is the mechanism in which you can teach the control plane new functionality. For instance, uh, you know, if you have a new platform service like a, you know, a cockroach DB database, or if you have a complicated application such as GitLab, you can extend crossplane with the functionality that it takes to deploy and manage, uh, configure, all that sort of stuff. Um, for that service or that application uh, that cross that's not you know built into the crossplane repository or the core crossplane functionality, um, but right now if you want to do that, if you for instance if you look at the GitLab controller, um, it it requires a full fledged controller runtime based um, you know custom controller for Kubernetes. You have to need to have Go code experience, um, and it's fairly the effort for that is fairly extensive. Um, and so we're we want to be able to have a lower barrier to entry or a a less complicated skill set required to be able to extend crossplane and incorporate new services, uh, complicated applications, etc. And so there are a number of different possibilities here we'd like to explore. And the key here will be around getting the user experience uh, correct and smooth and intuitive. And basically, you know, lowering the, the barrier entry here is really what this is all about. Um, so there's a couple different ideas such as a templated model where you can, um, where you can describe the functionality of the application of your service in, um, you know, in YAML with uh, uh, template values that can get filled in um, from a, the values that a user expresses on a CRD, uh, or be able to just write the core business logic of various functions uh, to manage the lifecycle of your service or your application, and have a, you know, uh, meta controller style 
controller be able to call into those functions. And so instead of writing a full fledged controller to, you know, manage, uh, to interact with the Kubernetes API, you'd be able to use um, a language of your choice, such as Python or JavaScript or whatever it may be to manage your application and just uh, focus on the logic that your application cares about, not all the plumbing, uh, et cetera, that's associated with the controller. And then another thing to potentially explore would be a whole domain specific um, language around this, you know, to capture the common set of tasks or functionality or operations that it takes to deploy and manage, you know, multi-cloud applications and workload portability, et cetera, um, and give a nice common experience around that that does not require a whole lot of new concepts or cognitive load to be able to understand how to manage your application in these environments. So people are, we're starting to explore this effort and um, you know, we want to be able to provide a nice experience to be able to help grow the cross-plane community and the ecosystem here and to you know, incorporate new services, new applications and uh, continue to grow this whole community. So I wanted to introduce that in this meeting here and just uh, kind of get that idea start to simmer and uh, as more designs and more effort goes on, uh, goes into this, we will continue to refine this idea and um, make progress on it. All right. Um, in the community topics here, uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about was a number of folks in the Crossplane community uh, were attending and also speaking at uh, the latest KubeCon China, which was held in Shanghai a week or two ago. And so there were two talks from folks from the um, uh, cross-plane community. Ilya spoke about how to extend the Kubernetes scheduler for multi-cluster and multi-cloud workloads. And in the agenda doc, we have uh, direct links to Ilya's slide deck as well as the YouTube recording. And then Steve talked about um, composability for cloud native applications and how to play well with others. And those, uh, that slide deck and video recording are also uh, here in the agenda document. Uh, for folks that are on the call that were um, in attendance at Shanghai, were there any um, you know, observations or key takeaways that you all had from being there in Shanghai and being part of uh, that ecosystem and that conference there? Phil, maybe you uh, maybe you had some observations. Yeah, absolutely. So there was a ton of excitement about uh, crossplane. Um, we had folks from the major cloud uh, providers over there, um, basically dropping by and, and wanting to uh, you know partner with us, and so kind of um, you know explored what that looked like, and they were super excited. And so um, you know, kind of as we make progress on this front, um, you know, being able to. Uh, you know, kind of work with them and enable them um, to join the community uh, would be really fantastic. So, you know, one of the things we're going to want to consider is how to kind of outreach as far as, you know, the community goes um, kind of into uh, um, into uh, Asia and stuff. Um, you know, uh, basically a lot of folks were saying as soon as, you know, um, we, we deliver kind of uh, the, the key capabilities, um, you know, with the uh, cross-plane services, um, you know, and kind of make that available and, you know, kind of like a, um, like a beta type release that um, they would, you know, be super interested in, in kind of picking that up. Um, and we also had a handful of, um, you know, folks from, um, you know, that were both like, you know, just traditional, you know, kind of uh, user contributors that had contributed to Kubernetes and Prometheus and other open source, uh, you know, projects in Kubernetes um, interested in, in contributing. So we're going to be doing an outreach program to uh, connect with them and um, basically uh, uh, help them uh, join uh, the community uh, more easily. So yeah, that was a really great conference and uh, super pumped about it. Cool. Thanks for sharing that, Phil. Um, one thing I was kind of curious about too is that um, you know the uh, the Asian market has a number of cloud providers as well. Um, you know, like the the big three North American uh, cloud providers that, that do have global reach, but they're largely American companies. Um, yeah. uh, Google and Amazon and Microsoft Azure. 
Uh, you know, that's one thing, and Crossman has support for that. But were you able to get any sense of some of the bigger Asian cloud providers? Like Alibaba is one of the first ones I can think of. Um, and, you know, what sort of services they have or if there would be much value in, you know, potentially thinking about integrations with some of those cloud providers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I did have chats with folks from all three. Um, I mean, the big one there is Huawei. And so there's Huawei Cloud. Um, and they're definitely kind of, um, you know, like the AWS equivalent in China. Um, in terms of kind of a uh, scope, but Alibaba Cloud, I would say, is probably a, a close second. Um, you know, kind of maybe like on the Azure. You know, if you had to compare the two in terms of, um, you know, kind of m maturity and stuff overall, and um, kind of maybe adoption um, in terms of customer base. And then Tencent seems to be um, a little bit smaller, but um, also one of the big three. So. Um, yeah, we made some really good connections with uh, folks from, from all three of those. Uh, they came by the booth, um, actually all multiple times. <laughs> so, uh, so that was actually really great. Um, they brought their coworkers and their bosses back um, to have conversations about, you know, like how to drive engagement. So um, yeah, so all of that was, was uh, super, um, super awesome. And um, you know, we got to got know them a little bit more on a personal level as well, you know, just in terms of like, you know, having conversations, um, you know, kind of about what they're doing here, uh, there in China and, um, you know, kind of like what their experience has been, you know, kind of working, um, you know, kind of with Kubernetes and, and in open source. So, um, yeah, I think that it could be, um, you know, super productive and, and look forward to welcoming them uh, to the community. Yeah. Very cool. I uh, I don't think I knew that Huawei uh, had their own um, you know public cloud offering as well that was that large. Uh, my my impression had been that Alibaba was the the biggest cloud offering over there, but I hadn't actually looked at any market numbers or anything to back that up. It was mostly just based on my own personal you know how many times have I seen the word mentioned? Uh, yeah, it's probably yeah. A very unscientific uh, approach to judging market share. Yeah, I mean. Um... Yeah, so Huawei basically had, you know, like the biggest humongous booth at the um, kind of like entry to the uh, the, the show floor. And, um, you know, it was definitely like, I would say at least twice as big as, you know, um, the, other, the other clouds at least. Um, and they seem to have like a very uh, broad reach in terms of, um, you know, the services that they're offering, um, as well as, you know, migrating to the cloud and, you know, kind of some pretty sophisticated um, approaches to that. So, yeah, it was definitely um, something that I hadn't experienced firsthand before. Uh, and so that was, um, you know, definitely uh, um, good to see, you know. Do they all have managed Kubernetes offerings? Um, so, I believe so. Yeah. I mean, the question is um, to the level of sophistication and, and integration. So where, you know, they start running into the problems is where Crossplane, you know, starts picking up um, in terms of, you know, integrating managed services, being able to bundle up, um, you know, stacks in a meaningful way, um, you know, um, and kind of making it easier to write these controllers for users. And so uh, what we saw is actually kind of a proliferation of managed Kubernetes. Um, you know, and it wasn't just um, those cloud providers, but also like Giant Swarm was out there mm. who we had met in Barcelona. Um, and, you know, like Lutza, um, I don't think I actually saw them at this one. So they might have just been in the, the Barcelona one, but there's lots of kind of managed Kubernetes providers. Um, and so the key thing that they're looking for is, you know, how to provide a more, um, you know, frictionless experience for consuming their services. And so that's why they're so excited about this is because it's like, hey, you know, if I'm writing Kubernetes apps, then it's a lot easier for me to, you know, start using the services in the cloud um, that I'm providing. Um, and so it just provides a more frictionless experience for them. Um, and so, yeah, they, they definitely like saw the value there and, um, you know, we're interested in, um, in helping kind of add providers uh, for their stuff. So as soon as we have, I think a more, um, you know, easily accessible and clearly communicated, like here's how you provide, um, here, here's how you build your own provider. Like if we had like a blog post on that or something like that, I think that that could actually like, we could use as a reference, especially with the language barrier and whatnot. Um, 
you know, could be something that um, would, would help uh, make it easier for them to um, kind of understand what they would need to do and, and how to contribute. So um, I think we have a little bit of work to do there, but um, yeah, in general, um, really great, great feedback and a lot of interest. Very cool, Phil. Very cool. Yeah, that's one thing that uh, you will, being on the floor of the expo halls at a KubeCon, you quickly realized how many uh, Kubernetes uh, distributions and Kubernetes managed Kubernetes offerings there are. There's a lot of them. Um, okay, thank you very much for uh, your observations and your insight from Shanghai. Appreciate that, Phil. Um, the next KubeCon is already getting ramped up and um, the call for proposals is, uh, the deadline is this Friday. So if you are interested in submitting a proposal to speak or talk at KubeCon in San Diego this November, the deadline is Friday. Um, all right, so there's a couple PRs that I wanted to mention here. Uh, Daniel, um, oh, we've, since we have two Daniels now, we're, uh, <laughs> we're going to have to start um, uh, uniquely identifying each. So Hashdan uh, <laughs> has a, a pull request here that is the um, beginning of the implementation for default resource classes, which is a great way to improve the user experience for Crossplane. Um, so this will be a huge contribution. Really excited about this. There was, um, you know, Nick gave this a very thorough review yesterday, but there was one part that I wanted to talk about a little further still, um, where, let's see if I can find it real quick. Here we go. So in this current design, uh, we have a default reconciler uh, per concrete class. And, um, but it seems like we only really would need one uh, at the you know, resource claim level at the general abstraction mm -hmm. like Postgres or um, you know, object storage buckets. Um, so in, in your explorations here, Daniel, did you, was there a, like a compelling reason uh, to, to not have, um, to not do this at the claim scope? Not at all. I, um, the initial implementation was basically just because I was following the uh, kind of uh, shared reconciler pattern that uh, Nick had established with the, um, the different concrete types. Uh, so that's kind of how I went about implementing it. But I totally agree that, you know, there's nothing unique about the individual claim type or the, sorry, the individual concrete types um, and rather just having, um, you know, uh, for instance, like with buckets, which is the one I showed the implementation for, you really only need one controller for all buckets, whether it's on Azure, AWS, or GCP. Um, there's not really anything different about it because um, we're just looking for a, a resource class that defines that kind, um, that claim type as default. So uh, we really only need one for each, as you suggested there. Um, and and so I've actually gone ahead and um, started some implementation on that. Um, and then I, I tagged Nick there just because he had had such a thorough review that I wanted to see if he saw any drawbacks because I didn't initially. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Thanks for looking into that. Yeah. When I was thinking about it more last night, um, the, I was, I was arriving kind of at a, a thought that, you know, if, say we have, you know, uh, if this is for S3, if, um, you know, Azure storage and Google uh, storage, if they all also made one of these reconcilers, would each one of the reconcilers be fighting over, you know, basically whoever gets to it first uh, would, you know, look at the default class and then, uh, you know, associate it with the claim type or the particular resource class. I wasn't sure who who you know had ownership there got multiple ones looking for it. That was one of my, I think one of my further concerns. Right. Uh, I just want to add on the same topic. Uh, you probably should consider for resource classes which are out of tree, because effectively if somebody adds new provider or digital ocean or I don't know make up Oracle Cloud, how would that coincide with this specific single controller? Just to, just a thought. You don't we don't need to talk about it right now. Just. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I wonder if that would be, you know, if we're talking about um, some sort of extension, if there would need to be an implementation of defaulting for that extension type. Um, but that would obviously be something that kind of would have to do with the, the type of extension. So I don't know. 
Yeah, when I was thinking about it, I think that, you know, a new claim would need, uh, like, a, so you, a, a claim type was added that was an extension, then that would need uh, some sort of default uh, mm -hmm. controller as well. But, um, you know, a, just a new concrete type uh, from another provider, I think, would still be covered uh, by, you know, the entry claim type uh, default reconciliation, I believe, right. from the, the investigation into the implementation I did yesterday. Right, like if it was a you know different database provider, but it was still a MySQL instance or something like that, then we'd be fine with the, the core one we have. I believe so. Yes. Um, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that's a great effort, Dan uh, or Hash Dan. Um, I think that that's going to be a, you know enormous improvement to user experience, um, you know, around like discoverability of resource classes and and not having to have the end user worry about that. Just give me a MySQL, please. <laughs> that's the experience we're enabling here and I, I really like that a lot this is great definitely thanks for the feedback uh and then i think uh so nick had brought up a um a one pager around resource usage uh so to collect all of his thoughts um and pretty extensively around how we model uh, resource usage in crossplane and so this is a great write-up here um, it looks like some great content here and um, Nick is interested in moving this along. I don't think he's on the call here today, but um, he would love some feedback and some, um, you know, some discussion on this, uh, potentially having an offline meeting uh, to discuss uh, more about this pull request and make some progress with it. Cause I believe this will serve as uh, some of the foundation for some other designs. So anyone who is interested in discussing this, um, can weigh in uh, and let's get something scheduled with Nick to push this forward and get some uh, closure on it. And that uh, the issue number or decide the pull request number was 564. It's uh, linked in the agenda document. Okay, so that is everything I had on the agenda document today were there any other uh issues or uh points to discuss while we are still in this uh this community meeting together okay then we will go ahead and uh, wrap it up for the week then. And a uh, reminder again about the KubeCon San Diego call for proposals, that's Friday. So um, definitely get to that before um, end of day on Friday if you want to speak at, here in San Diego. All right, everybody, thank you for joining and we will see you all in two weeks. Awesome, thanks, Jared. All right, bye everybody. Bye.